Hi everyone, Bees here. So you are about to watch a chat with the legendary D Schneider. Uh, we get really into it about the state of rock and metal in 2020. And I just want to make sure there's no gray area because I've seen comment sections and I know how this can go. We talk about the appropriation of heavy metal shirts. And what D means by that is when Justin Bieber takes Metallica's design or Kanye West does and makes a heavy metal version of it and they will get their place at the Grammys and all the rest of it and on mainstream radio. But the rock music that fuels that aesthetic, they won't touch us with a barge pole. That is what D means. So just clearing it up. Here we go. 20 minutes in the company of the legendary D Schneider. I am joined by the one and only D Schneider. D, I'm talking to you just before we release uh, For the Love of Metal live. The fact that there's a live version for the record, is that just symbolic of how much fun you had on the For the Love of Metal cycle? Well, um, I'm going to tell you right now that my managers are think I'm Nostradamus, okay, because uh, – <laughs> Spring of 2019, I told them I would be doing no live performing in 2020. I didn't realize it was a prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm supposed to, I was supposed to be shooting a movie, uh, directing a movie this year, uh, and, and now another movie actually I'm working on. But uh, so all of a sudden, I like, how did you know? How did you know? And I also said, they said, what should we do then for 2020? I said, well, let's film shows and – Let's do a live record, which turned out again to be very, very prophetic. Um, you know, it, one thing, it definitely is a fact. I was having fun. Mm. It turned into a band uh, about halfway after two years together. I remember the day my wife walked in the backstage. She goes, they don't look like much, but they kick fucking ass. <laughs> she's really old school, so she likes a band that, you know, has like the look. And these guys yeah. are very like, you know, you know, new metal, not NU. Yeah metal looking guys so but she goes and, and i said you know what you're right they really do kick ass so we're capturing that d has a new sound d, d's found himself the audience is reconnected with me you know and and i'm sort of and and i have a band and it sounds like a band so it was great to capture that and as it turned out it, it it's a good time for a live record yeah, like so. The, the it's funny that you say that you're directing a movie at the moment because one of the things that really stood out with for the love of metal and for the cycle for it is it forced everyone. I've been a fan of yours for fucking ever, and it forced everyone to reappropriate like what D Schneider is in the modern era. It kind of reminded me actually of when you did Strange Land, and even then, as a fan, it kind of reinvigorated your your perception of what the of what the Schneider is. Do you think that's a fair fair comment for for the love of metal? It's incredibly fair and you know look no one's more honest with me. I've been all over the map. I go I do whatever inspires me at the moment. And I remember when I told my manager I wanted to do a Broadway record and my manager said who's going to buy it? I said probably nobody, but I had just come off doing Rock of Ages for three months. I, yeah. I, I just had this thought and idea, and I wanted to do it. And it was it was very self-serving. But at the <laughs> same time, it, it didn't connect with anybody, and I wasn't surprised it didn't connect. Suddenly, mm. everybody was caught off guard. They, they had their love for me. They had their respect for me. They had their appreciation for me. But I wasn't connecting musically, mm. you know, not with something new. And all of a sudden, I do this record, Thank You, Jamie Jasta. And the audience is shocked. I'm shocked. <laughs> There's just this moment of everyone going, wait a minute, what's going on here? Like, did I just, you know, find my place here? And, and, and you know, and it, it surprised everybody. But at the same time, everybody was like, yes, yes, mm. welcome, welcome back. And I was like, it's good to be back. This, you know, this is where I wanted to be, but I didn't know how to get here. And Jamie Josta did, knew how to how to guide me there. So uh, yeah, it, it's fair to say it was a surprise. So, what was what was the vibe like when you were recording it? Because you must have known that this was a this was a quantum leap forward for you musically. Because I associate you. In fact, I've been using your line in broadcasting on the other side of the pond for about fifteen years about carrying the sword in a battle for heavy metal. Um, 
the fact that Jasta is someone that understands that as well, your kinship and your willingness to fight for our culture really made sense to me that you would make a record together and that you would vibe in the way that you did. We did. And, 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 and thank you for appreciating that. Cause that's one thing has been a constant and, and why the community has appreciated me no matter what I did. I've always stood tall, fought and for, for young bands and, and, and my, my love and belief in the music. And I never lost my love. I've been, thanks to my kids, I've been consistently connected to what's been going on since the 80s, going to shows, hearing music, being turned on to, you know, exposed and loving what's going on, the passion that's going on. Um, Jasta has that passion too. And he, you know, when he told me he knew what we needed to do, and we went into the studio the first day, a little hole in the wall studio, Fairfield, Connecticut. It's Nikki Belmore's place. And went in there and I, it was American Made and Running Mazes. And they put up the track for American Made. And I went in the booth and it just connected. And the first thing that came out of my mouth was that. And, and I was like, yeah. And like, like and my brain was going, fuck. This one, like, I felt it. I didn't know that in the other room, the th Nikki, Charlie, and Jamie were like, holy shit. <laughs> we all had that moment, of like, oh, what? It was just, I'm getting chills because it was that moment of, like, I, I, it was just, I, it was not strange. It was just magical. But, it, and just for that, it was like, yes, okay. And, and, the, and the next step was, well, I, I call it the trust fall. And I found out from Jamie that I wasn't Jamie's first time trying this. Apparently, he's challenged other people. He's been in the studio with other legacy performers. And yeah. no one would do the trust fall. No one would say, I'm putting my hands, putting myself in your hands, Jamie. Uh, you know, show me the way. Uh, yeah. said, every other every other heritage vocalist, every singer came in and said, Yeah, well, I like to, you know, and they immediately started grabbing the steering wheel and fighting for control. Yeah. And, you know, and this, re and, and he said, in order for it to work, it required the trust fall. And I, and Jamie, but Jamie earned the trust fall. I, I said, you know, when he, st when he started working on it, I said, so how are you doing this, man? He goes, D, I've listened to every single thing you've ever written and read every, and every song you ever sang. And I've read every word you ever wrote. He goes, I'm climbing, I've climbed into your skin. I know D. Snyder. So and when I heard that, I was like, whoa, the guy's really doing his. And, and that's why, even though he was writing the words, they could have come out of my mouth because they he was wearing the D. Snyder's flesh suit. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he was doing the Buffalo Bill. And then <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I'd fuck me. You know, like, Jamie, you're a little creepy now. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but he really and there was nothing when it was coming to me. I go, this is me. This is me. He, he gets me. He understands me. He respects me and appreciates me. And he's not trying to make me something I'm not. Mm. Well, I, I uh, for for my ears, what I like as someone that's got a hate breed tattoo on the side of their head, D, as well as being a long term fan of yours. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> like uh i like the fact that you could hear the jaster in it like the toughness and those breakdowns and you could hear your your personal power it felt like a real marriage and what's interesting to me is when you say about legacy performers and keeping in with what's happening in rock and metal like this year 2020 i mean it's been a shit year for the world, but rock and metal is absolutely crushing it. Like, shh, but it, there's some really fucking brilliant music coming out this year. And I put like cards on the table. I'm not sure I was ever going to, I wasn't sure I was ever going to love an Aussie record again with all of my heart wanting to. And then came his record under the graveyard this year. And he's worked with someone that's working with Post Malone and people like that. And he's inspired in that way. Do you keep, uh, in on the ground with the with those performers that have been on this journey with you before we talk about new bands and the state of heavy music in 2020. You know that's that's interesting because I don't, I mm. don't because I'm not so much to me. Um, you know, I, I, I don't make this a headline, of but course. I agree with your initial statement about Ozzy. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm a day one Black Sabbath fan, you know, so, mm. uh, but I, I don't, I'm surprised that because you said that, the way you said that, I'm like, oh shit, I got to go listen to that. Yeah. It's you the know? best, day, honestly, it's the best one since No More Tears. Well, and that's it, you know, like we tend to step on our own dicks. <laughs> we, yeah. We tend yeah. to, like, the artists tend to, not through the trust fall, we tend to insist. Oh, we 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 know you know we we know better, and we don't. And that's why when you've seen amazing records, uh, what's his name who produced the Johnny Cash record uh, was it Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin did. A, he's one of those trust fall guys where certain people like have said, okay, you know what, I'm going to put myself in the hands of Rick Rubin, mm. and he's done a mir miraculous records for people who are willing. And he's one of those guys too, who I'm sure just. Mm. Just put on the Johnny Cash suit, flesh yeah. suit, and then said, got in there and said, okay, I am the man in black. Now, what should he be doing? So yeah. it's rare that we take that chance. Mm. And, and that's why I don't pay attention to most of my peers when they put out new music gotcha. because it's usually garbage and mm. they, or, or just rehashed garbage. And, and I'm really happy to hear that about Ozzy because we need to be shown. We need to be willing to trust younger artists and who are more who, who's, who are fans and have respect for us and say, help us here, guide us. If we want to be engaged in the new audience, we need guidance for sure. Mm. So let's talk about the the younger side of things then, because here's this uh, the, uh, for some mad reason our paths have never crossed. And I've always wanted to have this chat with you. Um in 2020, we sit at unfortunately the first decade that has gone past where our culture hasn't had anything to say in terms of pop culture in terms of mainstream culture i don't think that while there's shit tons of people at the shows and festivals like tens of thousands of people turn up and love this music the headliners for those festivals are going to be dwindling they're dwindling as it is and they're going to continue to dwindle so as a culture where do you take What's your take on where we are as a culture in 2020 rock and metal? And like the question that I guess I'm kind of asking and the fate that I am desperate for us to not befall is not becoming jazz, if you hear what I'm saying. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're very good, my friend. You're very good. Um, well, you, you, you know, you answered the question, but it's, and, but that's okay. It, mm. In and of itself, because and that's one of the things with For the Love of Metal, the video aspect, the live uh, album I wanted to show. Uh, if you've seen it, uh, when people watch it, I cut from country to country, day to night, rain to sun in one line of the song. It mm. bounces all over the world. And I wanted to show the community, the connection, the similar, how we are more alike than we are different. When you go from South America to Europe and the mm. audience may be browner, but they're wearing the same clothes, they're singing the same words, and the passion is there. So the community is is super strong. But you're right, we're we're more under the radar. Um, part of me feels that we're healthier there, even though I I I, I always thought we deserve the place, uh, you know, at the table. Yeah, you know, uh, we deserve we deserve a place at the table. But you're right, the legacy artists. There are no new rock stars, and I feel that's directly because of the way music is marketed now. It's so targeted marketed. People, there's not that spillover of MTV, bus, billboards, bus, you know, advertisements on the radio that everybody heard. So you knew about a band, you knew about an artist, even though you didn't follow the band. You knew Twisted Sister, you knew Kiss, yeah. you knew Ozzy, the reality TV aspect of shit. You don't see that for any of the new artists. So they're known by their fans, but nobody else. So, you know, where do you get the headliners? Where do you get those those mega bands? I don't have the answer for you. Mm. Uh, so so you say, I think the scene is healthy, but we're losing our place at the table. Yeah. See, this is it. That's the, the line that I always say, D, is I'm sick and fucking tired of splashing around in the kiddie pool. 
right? I'm sick and tired of being on the pre-show for the Grammys. I'm sick and tired of it because artists aren't given the chance to develop. There are artists out there that are two records deep and showing promise up the arse, but they can't get to album three because they can't make the fucking money. Like, what can we do? Is what? Like, when did this change, man? Like, because the thing is, like, I'm... I'm 36, right? So I grew up with new metal was my thing. So we still had a place at the mainstream table and no one's first favourite band, the Napalm Death. So, like, are we just less dangerous? Is that why we're less appealing now? Is that why why rap stars are out there saying that they're the rock stars? And is 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 that is that it? Like, because I because I don't get it. Okay. This is, oh, dude, you're really good. You're really good. Okay, <laughs> you do a lot of you. things. You're really good. And the conversation's really good, and it, it and, and and important. Well, we first of all we fucked up. Um, we, you know, people. I've talked about this at length. They say why there's a, there's a study that headbangers are health grow up to be healthier adults than non-headbangers. And Psychology Today interviewed me and said why. I said I know exactly why because we give a place to let out the darker emotions, hate, frustration, depression, uh, heartbreak, anxiety, all those things are, those, those emotions are released through heavy metal. But we went through a period uh, during this, during the scream, all the whiny uh, mm. 2000s yeah. where we didn't allow that. It was a complainy, whiny, bitchy time. <laughs> lyrically. Yeah. yeah. And, and upstepped hardcore rap, gangster rap, and gave that outlet, that middle finger factor that we needed that had disappeared from the metal. I'm sorry, Soundgarden, I love Soundgarden, but it was just mm. too whiny and complaining and depressed. Mm. Okay, it didn't, it wasn't angry enough. Mm. And, and, and hip hop stepped in and said, well, hey, white kids, and I'm sorry, but there's white kids who went, went over there in, in mass, here's some yeah. music for you. That lets you get that shit out. Mm. And I love hip hop, by the way, I, because it does, because it has that, yeah, fuck you. You mm. know, okay. So now metal's gotten back to that, but we gave, we, we gave away our sort of the crown yeah. at one point. So mm. that was a problem. And then, of course, the, you know, the, you know, the Dow free downloading and social, the social media marketing, the whole game mm. changed. So it's tough to get back that. We have no exposure to get back to that place at the table that we gave up mm. to the hip-hop yeah. community. Yeah. See, to me, the hip-hop community, what spoke to me about hip-hop was it felt like it was telling me working-class problems, right? And yeah. even, even if, like, some of the issues weren't directly like directly my issues they were issues that you would see on the street and feel angry about and that was that was the appeal of hip-hop i i totally take your point about yeah. about that era um but today like when you talk about the healing power of metal and empowerment and things like that i'd like to just tell you a quick story it was um oh. on twist on twisted sisters final run uh, i was actually at hellfest where you did we're not going to take it twice and yeah. dedicated to the people um, of the Paris bombings yeah. and the message of the song and the feeling there. Like, honestly, I'm getting goosebumps even talking I'm getting, about I'm it. Now. Coming, so I'm remembering it now. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. and I feel that that's a message that we've got for the world. And I just, I, I, ref, I refuse to, <laughs> I ref, not to cliche it, but i am like, we shouldn't take it and we shouldn't take the fact that we've, We've lost that place. Um, this, is I, this is why I get upset about the appropriation of our imagery, of our attitude, yeah. of so many things. And people say, what are you complaining about the T-shirts? And, and you know, and what are you complaining about? I had, a, I had a website called Take Back the Horns. Because, right. you know, I mean, I would saw some mother. I was at an airport, and little Johnny came out of the men's room. And I don't know if he was five or whatever. And he walked out, and Mom looked at him. He was zipping his fly. And, and, and she looked at him, and he went, and mom went, yes, <laughs> yes, the horns, because Johnny took a piss on his own. That's not what this is about. <laughs> and, I, and I opened the website for many years, Take Back the Horns, because it, it had been appropriated by everybody else. Yeah. You know, 
I just yeah. checked out a lot, seven seven items or less at the grocery store. No, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Away. <laughs> you know, and they'll give us back our damn t-shirt we got fights for those fucking t-shirts mm. you know so there's just been appropriation of what they like about us and then just leaving the rest of it behind mm. you know because it's not palpable to them so it, it's been a frustration i'll tell you i'll tell you my frustration with it day is the way the word rock has changed like um when I like, and, and this is it. Like, we are not like both of us are switched on, right? There are there are electronic bands, and that like I, like horror in the world of hip hop play as hard as anything in metal. They have their place in this culture, absolutely. Carpenter, Brute, and Ghost, and all these bands that are like synth wave bands that play hard have their place in this. But when you look at what rock is and what the banner of rock is and what they try saying rock and alternative is in 2020, that ain't it. It just ain't it, right? Right. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Look, it's been going on yeah. for way too long. And, and, it, and unfortunately, like many things, people never realize it until it's too late. You know, I mean, it's not to go back to the 80s and the censorship thing. But when I went in there, I thought everybody was going to see the significance of what was going on. But they didn't. Mm. My peers didn't. The majority of fans didn't. They were like, no, we know what records to buy. That's not the fucking point. Mm. Okay? And when the hard rock hotels and restaurants, there was a point where the hard rock was a restaurant in London. And it was about the Who and Hendrix and mm. about hard rock. Okay, mm. and, and but all of a sudden now it's a it's a burger joint where you take your family and 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 Madonna's stage outfit is there, you know, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, all the non rock bands that are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It mm. it's been the appropriation and misappropriation of our music, our art form is just awful. And I and I think we've lost control of that. And I keep trying to remind people. I had this thing where I was trying to get ACDC at the Super Bowl. And yes. people are ACDC. I said, because they're the most likely ones to be able to get in through that doorway and remind people of what rock is. Mm. You know, we're gonna we're not gonna get Napalm Death there. Okay. Mm. So it's got to be someone who's got the second biggest selling record in the history of recorded music that has crossed over to every genre. Everybody loves ACDC. Maybe we can get them through the door and the rest of us will follow through. But I'm just trying to regain, again, that place at the table mm. by showing people the community and what our value is. You yeah. know, uh, you get that frustration and I'm going to have to hand this torch off to you at some point. <laughs> you ain't getting any younger, man. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting anywhere. Wow. For the years of no, fucking like a cranky old guy. No, you I'm do not. not. I'm not having it. I'm not having it. I make no, you. No, right. you're, not, you're not. But to people who give me that shit, I go, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> well, that old cranky guy. I remember in my day, I'm yeah. like, uh, yeah, it's not I need you. I need you now. You're young. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, this is it. It's not. It's not. Well, I'm fucking going. Uh, well, I'll tell you after we after we finish recording. But we'll keep fighting that fight, D. And the live album is coming. I think that one of the things that also stands out about it is your work ethic is all over this release, mate. Because it's not just not just a live album. It's a DVD and behind the scenes and interviews and commentary. Like, was it important? in putting this out and this being the kind of full stop on this particular album cycle. Um, was it important to give it everything? Yeah. Um, there's a lot. One of the things is I wanted to connect the dots there. You know, uh, there are people who, you know, like going, well, how does this connect to where you came from? People who know they're, they get it. Mm. I know. And I, but I wanted to put it all together in one record. And so, and you know, Twister was a metal band. I've been saying this recently. In the early 80s when we toured with Saxon and Metallica and Motorhead and Iron Maiden, it was just, we were just a weird metal band. And nobody thought strange that Motorhead and Twister's sister were on the same bill or Twisted and, and Metallica. They were there from the beginning of the show and, and were roaring for both bands. You know, I mean, it was like, okay, they're a metal band. They're just a different metal band. Then suddenly it became hair metal, and suddenly we got known for the couple of you know couple of anthems, and suddenly no people forgot that we were a metal band. So with mm -hmm. the love of metal live, I chose 
the more metallic twisted songs. And then when you when my band leans into it, detune, then add a little more here and there, uh, all of a sudden you're going, oh, look at this. It's, it kind of all works together. And there's even a little Widowmaker in the middle there somewhere. And you go, oh, so this is Dee's journey. And this is kind of makes sense where he is now. And as far as the interview stuff, well, I had done this in Australia, done these spoken, uh, it was called Shouted and Spoken. One day I'd do a live show and the next day I would do like an interview thing. It was weird. But it was interesting that the conversations kind of connected the dots too, like where I came from and how and where I am today and how I got there. So to me, this is, you said, the final stop. That was great phraseology. Like, okay, and, and, and Prove Me Wrong is a new song written by me and Charlie Belmore beginning of this year, put on the record, and it's it's a message on two levels, obviously the statement itself, but also this is D. Snyder. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, this wasn't a one and done. I have found my place. I have found my sound. This is anything moving forward. This is what you can expect from me. Prove me wrong. Sounds like it could have been from For the Love of Metal. It wasn't. Mm-hmm. It is moving forward. And so last question from me, D. You're making this movie – um, like the work ethic in you and this lockdown situation, are you climbing the walls or are you staying active? Like, how's it been? I, every day I'd wake up and this is the truth. And I'd look and I go, Oh my God, I don't have enough time today. And all I was doing is sitting in my um, house because I wrote my first fictional novel, Frats. It's called, it's out of publishers right now. Uh, I was supposed to be directing my first feature film, which I wrote, it's called uh, My Enemy's Enemy. It was supposed to start in May, it's been postponed. Then I got a, a directing and wrote, by the way, I got uh, offered another movie to direct and write a reimagining of uh, 80s classic, which I can't mention the name right now. But so I was working on the treatment uh, and I finished the treatment for that. Now I'm working on the screenplay for that. So I had been nonstop, not enough hours in the day, uh, all focused on writing, and I just started a second novel. So I, <laughs> the thing is, I wanted to. I told my, I want to take off this year to write, and that's all I've been doing because that's all I can do is sit in my house and write. So uh, I've been super busy. Expect movies and books from D. Snyder, and then more music after that. Well, this door is always open for when you've got things coming out. Make sure you come back and see us for the years, uh, for the passion and for keeping the fight in the world of rock and metal. Thanks so much for your time this morning, brother. And I thank you for a great interview. And I will look forward to Mosh, talking to Mosh Talks again. Take care. Thank you, sir. All right. Bye bye.